Hello, um, I'm Jerry Baker. I'm the editor at large of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you uh, this afternoon, my time from New York, uh, this evening in uh, Europe and whatever time of day it is elsewhere. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we've got a uh, terrific panel uh, today to talk about well, the topic of the panel is the outlook for the US and the global economy. We have a very international panel, so we'll keep it very, very global, uh, as well as looking obviously at the US. Um, we're, it's obviously a year, we're a year, almost exactly a year from when COVID-19 really began to um, hit um, most of the most of the, the what we used to call the West, uh, Northern Europe, Western Europe, North America, and South America, and indeed the rest of the world. Um, and uh, we've learned a lot in the last year. And one of the objectives of this panel uh, is to um, try and explore uh, what's changed um, over the last year, what's changed permanently. With we're hopeful now that in much of the world we'll be resuming some version of normality over the course of the rest of this year. But I want to get a sense of, firstly, how quickly will that come? How will we um, uh, return to um, the kind of economic activity and the kind of lives that we were living uh, over the next few months? But also what will change permanently? What's going to be changed both in terms of business practices, working practices, in terms of policy, the role of government? We've, we've, we've learned a lot. Again, we've done many things in the last year that many people never thought we would do in terms of not only in terms of business and working practices, but in terms of policy, the role of government um, and very, lots of other aspects of our lives. So I want to explore that with our very distinguished panel. Um, and I'll just introduce them briefly. Uh, Ibukun Awasika is the uh, chair of the uh, First Bank of Nigeria. She's the first woman to hold that chair. She's a Nigerian, uh, a long career, very long and successful career in Nigerian uh, business. And she's been a leader in uh, many ways, in many um, uh, economic and uh, much of the economic and social projects uh, and developments in Nigeria and, uh, and, a, and a successful author too. Um, Lord Karen Bilimora is the president of the Confederation of British Industry, has been in that role since since the middle of last year. Um, another also highly successful entre the, the CBI. I'm sure you know is the major body that represents uh, British uh, business, um, um, both nationally and internationally, with input to government and um, around the world. Uh, Lord Billamora is a highly successful entrepreneur, famous perhaps mostly for being the founder of Cobra Beer. He's also, of course, a member of the House of Lords, um, and he serves uh, in a number of uh, advisory uh, roles um, in the UK and around the world. Dambisa Moyo is an author. Uh, an economist of many, many best-selling books. Um, her first book, actually, I think it was uh, Dambisa Dead Aid, was a, an enormously influential book that changed many people's thinking about um, aid, about development uh, aid, and I think was incredibly influential. And she's had a, a succession of books since then. And another book, I believe, coming out um, in May about um, corporate governance called How Boards Work, uh, coming out on May the 4th. So do look out for that. Dambisa, of course, serves on several corporate boards, too. And as I say, is a very distinguished speaker and uh, author and economist. And and finally, Michael Schwo. Michael uh, is a real estate developer uh, based in the United States, a very successful um, uh, career developing um, uh, real estate uh, across uh, the country um, in, in running his own company, which he himself founded. Um, and he's um, grown to be an enormously uh, successful and very prominent and also has some very um, important uh, thoughts and observations um, about how, from the perspective of real estate and the broader economy, how we can expect things to develop. So let's get straight into it. So I want to start off. I'm going to let me start off. I want to ask all of you, um, first of all, to give us your view of what you've learned in the course of the last year about the way our lives um, have obviously been forced to change. And what from that, what we've learned to do better, um, how important those changes will be in our lives going forward, what we can expect maybe to return to pre-COVID normality, but but also what's going to change? What have we learned that will help us um, develop to, to, to as both as businesses, but also more broadly as economies and societies, what we learn going forward from the experience of the last year. So if I could start with you, um, Mrs. Awasika, from your perspective, um, obviously uh, in, in Nigeria um, and, you know, as, as a as someone who uh, is the chair of a large bank, give us a sense of your experience of the last year and what you think, how you think the world will be changed by what we've seen over the course of the last year. Thank you very much, and it's really my pleasure to be here. 
Well, I, I think first and foremost, there's been uh, quite a shift in terms of there's so many more things we can do without leaving the four walls of our homes now, as we have had to experience and discover extensively over this uh, period of time. But one other thing that I've noted that I also think it's uh, important and crucial, especially for women, is within the period of um, the last 12, 13, 14 months, there has been quite um, a showing of those skills that were either to consider as soft skills, but are more likely, they're better identified as strategic skills, which are skills that women are naturally better at which has become extremely useful and necessary within the context of um, this uh, pandemic period. And we've all had to learn how to adjust better applying uh, those uh, strategic skills. Uh, we've learned empathy because there's just been so much death and sadness around you. You, you could not but think about your neighbors. Uh, we've also learned the value of making sure that everyone, at least I have in terms of my country, making sure that everyone is taken care of because, you know, the best of all, the best of you can't survive if the least of you isn't taken care of. And the period of um, the pandemic did show the gap even much more because you could then see the sheer numbers of people who are living from hand to mouth and couldn't really survive without uh, their regular income on a daily or monthly or weekly basis. So it, it's really looking at all of those social factors and realizing at the end of the day, if we don't take care of the least of us, the best of us is threatened. And then looking at uh, like the pandemic itself the, uh, and uh, realizing that we do need to ensure that the whole world is covered in terms of uh, vaccines. We need to take care of everyone if we all want to be safe, because otherwise it would affects uh, global trade and all our supply chain issues, and it would e eventually come on to roost in terms of how we do business. Thanks, um, Ms. Elsie. I want to pick up on all on all of those points, particularly the points about um, global trade and the disruption to global supply chains that we've seen over the last year. But Dan Bisa Moya, if I can come to you, what do you think are the most important things that we, we have been learning about um, the way the, the, the enforced learning that we've had from the combination of the pandemic and, and lockdowns over the last year and the confines that we've been working under, and what, what, what will change, what will permanently change, you think, uh, from what we've seen in the last year? Well, thank you so much for um, including me on this panel. I'm, I'm delighted to participate. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's important for us to appreciate that even before uh, COVID hit in earnest, we were already grappling with a whole suite of economic um, challenges and, and of course geopolitical, everything from the risk of technology as a uh, disruptor of the jobless underclass, demographic shifts um, that we had not uh, seen in terms of the pace of growth of the world's population, but also under investment in education, widening income inequality, climate change and natural resource scarcity, the sheer levels of debt um, that the global economy was carrying, and then, of course, uh, declines in productivity over time. Um, it is clear that COVID has accelerated uh, all of these aspects and many other challenges, as I mentioned, such as uh, uh, you know the risks of impotence of public policy, but also geopolitical risks. Um, in terms of what we have learned, I really believe that this has been an opportunity um, to, uh, to reset and to think about the role of corporations. Um, you know, it is clear that governments um, have been much more reactionary over the past several decades. Um, we were ill prepared um, for the pandemic. Um, I myself had written in 2017 about the, the fact that this risk had been discounted. Um, clearly, uh, the world is much more deglobalized than we had anticipated, not just in terms of the response to the pandemic, in terms of all of us trying to uh, rush around and public policy trying to rush around, around quarantining, around uh, uh, the reaction to the vaccine, to the, uh, a big important to the, uh, the pandemic initially, but also look at how um, fragmented the approach has been in terms of vaccinations, a rollout, notwithstanding uh, the, uh, the progress with COVAX, uh, et cetera. So I think what have we learned? The world is far more deglobalized, much more balkanized, um, for a whole host of reasons that we'll touch on, but also the importance of corporations having a seat at the table 
um, not just for human progress, but also in terms of addressing these big um, structural challenges that the world faces has become clear. Um, our governments are ill-prepared. Um, and, uh, you know, that's to say that I think that we will see improvements in public policy here. Um, but I think that the, the notion that um, corporations in the private sector has been seen as distant, particularly in the West, seen as distant and sort of not at the table, um, I think has been uh, clearly debunked. And, and I, I'm very much hopeful that there'll be much more cooperation between the public sector and the private sector so that we're not reactionary, but we actually start to think much more as pro in a proactive way as the truth be told, uh, as, as governments um, behaved in, in, uh, in, in decades past. Um, the development of Silicon Valley, DARPA, uh, Manhattan Project, this was government at its best in terms of initiatives, um, you know, foretelling, telegraphing future uh, sort of uh, developments for human progress. I think what we've seen is really a lot of reaction. Um, and, and I'm very hopeful that this would be a lesson uh, for us, uh, both in the private sector as well as the public sector, uh, on, on how to, uh, to to think about the world going forward. Thank you, Demisa. Uh, Michael Schwo, if I may come to you. Um, obviously, real estate, everybody's been very uh, much focused on real estate. Uh, we've all got used to discovering how much we can work from home uh, or remotely, at least, um, over the course of the last year. It's led to a lot of people wondering about, you know, what is the future of the office? What is the future of uh, the workplace? What is the future of cities beyond that? And all of those questions. Um, what's your sense? Um, do you think we're going to see fundamental permanent changes um, in the way in which people work and the implications that that will have for business, for real estate, uh, for the economy going forward? Or do you think actually, actually, this is all overdone and we're, 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 we're sort of going to some one way or another going to go back to all looking forward again to being around the office cooler and doing what we always used to do? So thank you for having me, and good morning here from the U.S. Um, I, I, as far as where we are, we stand today, we're seeing currently the market be very reactionary to this past year of of of, of the turbulence on this with this vaccine. Uh, human nature at, of people is to be together. We want to be together. It doesn't matter if it's at home. It doesn't matter if it's at the office. We are. We need the, the 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 human interaction in order to to flourish. You can see that in businesses. Um, you know, there's been for the past decade we've seen a lot of the big company, the Google, Facebook, Apple, spend a tremendous amount of money and efforts really to create a corporate culture and give all these this this these perks to their employees to create a campus when they come to work. This attitude does not go away overnight just because we, we were experienced something that is obviously horrible, uh, but human nature is not going to change. People will come back to the office. I think there will be changes. I think we're going to see short-term changes in the, office, uh, um, in the office market just because uh, there's, companies feel like it's a socially responsible thing to do. You have to give people more space, right? We've been, we've been seeing a shift over the past two decades from you know 20 years ago you would an employee would have approximately 300 square foot of, of of space dedicated to them it went down to 100 space 100 square foot if you look at the we works of the world and the shared models space became very congested we're going to see the shift go the other way around we will see some companies and we're seeing right now letting employees work from home but it's a moment in time. We're seeing these big headlines that company says employees can work at home forever. You have to read the fine print. It also says that your pay is not going to be the same that it was if you're coming to the office. So people are trying to figure out right now exactly what to do. Big corporations are trying to figure out what to do. Nobody wants to be the follower, but, but many are scared to be the leaders. I think that once, you know, once we're going to get through this and, and as uh, um, we've just heard, you know, the vaccine is the most important thing that, that, that is in front of us right now to get through, to make sure the entire world is vaccinated because the U.S. alone or Nigeria alone or Europe alone is not enough. We all have to be vaccinated and we all have to protect the, the world as a whole, not as individual countries. But eventually people will come back to work. We're going to see people back at restaurants. And I'll just, just finish with this. I'm in Miami right now. Miami, when you walk the streets of Miami, it feels like there's no, COVID does not exist. It's an unbelievable phenomenon. And the reason is 
there is warm weather, people naturally go out, and the economy is open. Right or wrong, I won't debate that, but you see the need of people to be together. You saw New York, this past week, we had one nice day in New York City, I believe it was Tuesday. The city was, was booming. People were out on the street like they were pre-COVID. The warm weather and, and a little bit of, of openness from, from the business side will get people back out. And I do think things are going to get back to normal. Um, I know that might not be the, the consensus of, of people, but I think that human nature will prevail. Thanks, Michael. I, I think we may have lost Lord Billimore. I don't. I can't. I don't see him on my screen. Ah, oh, no, there you are. Sure. You're here, sir. We we have your. Uh, we have a still picture. Great. I'm glad, delighted you're here. Thanks. So, so uh, Lord Billimore, let me, let me come to you then. Um, you know, from your perspective, and I get. I want to get on to some of the issues that, that everybody's raised so far. But tell us, from your perspective, what do you think um, is going to be fundamentally, structurally changed uh, after the pandemic, and, and what can we expect to kind of revert to some sort of normality? Can you hear me and see me clearly now? We can hear you. We just have you. We can see your still, your admirable still picture. We can't see you in um, video, but we can so we can hear you clearly. So please go ahead. Okay. Um, so firstly, I think that we've got a we've had global crises before. The last one was the financial crisis, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. But this is like a crisis unlike any any of us would remember in terms of being truly global and demand shock, supply shock. A health crisis, economic crisis with the dominoes reverberating around the world. And that we've had to adapt and adopt at speed. When it comes to technology, Satya Nadella of Microsoft said, I think it was in May, two years into the two months into the pandemic, that we've adopted in two months and adapted to what would normally take two years. And what we've had is the network effects taking place. We've had this technology we're now using for years. We just haven't used it. We were using telephone conference calls. Necessity becomes the mother of invention, and we've now moved to another level. And now we're going to use it going forward. So the, the future is not going to be what it was before. It's, not, it's going to be a new normal, that's for sure. And what I've seen in this pandemic is, is compassion. What I've seen is a sense of community. What I've seen also that has not worked and I'm president of the Confederation of British Industry, the largest business organization in the UK. We speak for 190,000 businesses employing 7 million people, one third of the private sector workforce and 200 trade unions from the National Farmers Union, the Law Society right across the UK. So we've seen that government on its own doesn't work. Uh, top down from the government, when it came to the testing program, it didn't work. And what's the best example of collaboration? When the vaccine task force was set up by Boris Johnson, he put Kate Bingham in charge on the 8th of May, and then we worked at speed with government and the private sector working together. We had the first inoculation seven months later on the 8th of December. We had 400 million vaccines procured from different supplies from around the world. And that is just phenomenal. It would not have happened unless the private sector and government and universities all work together. And the best example is Oxford, AstraZeneca, British University, AstraZeneca, British Swedish company, headquartered in Cambridge. And what, and what more, the Serum Institute of India, the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, has got a collaboration with Oxford AstraZeneca for a billion doses. So it's absolutely incredible the way collaboration has been so powerful. The next aspect is we've seen in this crisis, on the one hand, you're trying to survive. On the other hand, it's time of crisis that you can actually make major change going forward. And then no better example, best way to predict the future is to look to the past. In the Second World War, the Beverage Report 1942 commissioned by the government, it was implemented after 1945, after the Second World War, and we had the National Health Service and we had the welfare state, which changed the history of the United Kingdom. So the CBI now, we're looking right in the middle of this crisis now for an economic vision for the next decade for the United Kingdom. What are our priorities going to be? Where are we going to be competitive? And we're doing that in the midst of a crisis. And finally, we've also what's come to the fore is that young people have really suffered in this crisis, whether it's at school, whether it's at universities, whether it's going to be getting jobs, they have suffered. And when you ask young people what's really important to them, two things stand out. One is climate change in the environment, and the other is diversity and inclusion. And we've got COP26, which we're hosting in the UK later this year, which is a huge global opportunity. And with diversity and inclusion, I'm the first ethnic minority president of the CBI in its history, and we've launched Change the Race Ratio to champion ethnic minority participation across business. Thanks, Orville Moore. Let, let's, let's talk about the, the, the economic outlook um, then, uh, just looking forward over the next six months or a so, year or so. I, I, Dan Bisa and David and I are all here in the US, and I think it's fair to say that the 
um, optimism is rising uh, rapidly in, in the U.S. Um, the Federal Reserve has just increased its forecast significantly for growth this year. You know, there's pretty, they seem to be pretty much on course to have uh, the Biden administration has said, and everybody who wants a vaccine, uh, who will get a vaccine by the summer, by the early summer, probably at the latest. Um, there's expectations with tremendous amount of pent up demand from a uh, huge increase in savings that we saw in the U.S. over the last year. The administration, the, the Congress has just passed into law and in a huge um, uh, fiscal support package, $1.9 trillion, almost 10 percent of GDP. It all looks set fair for the United States to have a boom. In fact, you know, so much so that I think a lot of people are concerned. Growing numbers of people are concerned about the risks of uh, inflation, that actually we may have too much demand uh, chasing too little supply in the U.S. over the next over the next year or two. The rest of the world is a, more of a mixed picture, I think it's fair to say. And I want to ask you, Ibukun, how you see things. Um, you know, you have the U.S. looking, as I say, looking pretty strong. You know, Asia, China, you know, which 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 had, had a relatively short, um, um, shallow uh, economic uh, uh, setback last year is bouncing back. But Europe is obviously some way behind the curve on the vaccine front. The UK, as you've heard, a little bit more said, has done has done very well. And and much of the emerging world is also perhaps, you know, given it's de- given how much it's dependent on global uh, trade flows and global economic activity is, is perhaps a little in little less well placed than, say, it currently looks like places like the United States and the UK. Ibukin, if I could ask you, how do, how do you see this? Is this is this a fair picture that you see? Am I right in saying that we're going to see very significantly differentiated economic performance over the next year or two? Well, I mean, you've created what can be considered a fair, a fair picture. But the, the thing to then consider is, can uh, the U.S. survive alone? You know, even if everything is going to work for the U.S. at the end of the day, part of what we saw that the pandemic revealed is how integrated the world economy is in terms of relationships and trade across borders and the dependence of one economy upon the other economy and all of that. So we we do have to, which is the reason why the vaccine is important, because you want to solve the problem for everybody so you can get everybody to sort of kickstart their economic activities uh, as well, so that our our supply chain um, can be established. It can continue to work even as uh, the countries are, everybody's going back to their own tent and we're becoming a bit more nationalistic in terms of, but all of that will take time. It's not something you can immediately withdraw back into into your tent. So I believe that as um, good as the uh, facts look for the US, the impact of the rest of the world not being able to get its uh, system working will impact the ability of the U.S. itself, you know, to um, look at South America. There's a lot going on in South America that will impact America in itself. And Europe is a major uh, trading block, you know, for the U.S. So it, it's really about we need to solve the problem together in the interest of all of us and all of the economies around the world, from the small ones to the big ones. And which is why collaboration between the global leaders will make a difference. And I'm glad that it's a great Nigerian woman who is uh, at the top of WTO right now. And uh, she's got her head in the right direction. She's smart. She's dynamic. She will do what she says she will do. And I know that women are great at being able to bring people together so we can solve some of the problems that can hinder the possibility of the future growth expectations that we, we can see. Thank you. Dambisa, you, you talked in you know, your opening remarks about how de- de-global- the deglobalizing trend was already in place before COVID and COVID almost certainly seems to have accelerated it. You know, just heard Ibukun talking about, you know, sort of vaccine nationalism and concerns about that. And, and we are seeing, as I said, as I said in my remarks, a pretty divergent economic performance we can expect to see with the U.S. kind of probably leaping ahead and um, other parts of the world maybe not doing so well. Is this if, 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 if this is which I'm sure you're right, it seems to be at the sort of structural trend of deglobalization does seem to be in place. Does that suggest actually that that's one thing that even, even as the economy, all the economies start to recover, um, you know, to, to something like pre-COVID levels, the kind of longer term rate of growth we can expect the sort of trend rate of growth is going to be lower because we're going to lose out from many of those efficiencies from globalization, free, you know, free movement of trade and capital and people. Is that something that's going to be a big constraint on global growth going forward? So, I, you know, um, before I, I uh, answer your question, let me just say for the record, I am a bit globalist. I believe in globalization. Um, 
you know, it, it, certainly the, in the way it's it's uh, described when I was doing my PhD in the textbooks. Um, and by that, I mean globalization, not just in terms of trade, in terms of capital flows, in terms of the movement of people, in terms of global standards, and but also in terms of global cooperation. So those five pillars, to me, the efficacy of human progress, economic growth, our ability to grow the pie and not just focus on redistribution is 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 absolutely intricate, intricately uh, linked to a good globalization uh, agenda. Um, but I'm also not um, sort of uh, sort of uh, so Pollyanna-ish about globalization as to to be uh, much more, shall we say, le- I should say less sanguine um, than perhaps uh, uh, my esteemed colleague was just explaining. I think as a practical matter, um, the, the we know that the um, uh, the world tends to trend towards much more. Uh, deglobalized states. And if you look at the history and not just the past uh, 1950 to 2008, where globalization was full steam, go back to the Gilded Age in the United States, 1870 to 1900, where very similar pillars, uh, you had a lot of trade, you had large corporations, you had uh, government, you know, providing a laissez-faire approach, which actually helped to drive a lot of economic success that was quickly followed by a progressive agenda, which was much more smooth holly, much more nationalistic. So um, I think that it's the tension. I mean, right now I spend a lot of time um, with our family office investing. So where do you put money in this kind of a world? And the truth is, I think we're headed for a much more fractured, balkanized world. It's it's not what I want. But it's, you know, the rationale and people might say, well, the United States can't survive um, on its own. I think the, the USPs, the unique selling points for the United States and, and indeed, um, to some extent, China are very different and much more um, positive for them to, to make very compelling arguments that they're OK going at it alone. The United States has clean air. It's got its own energy sources. It has talent. It has uh, you know, uh, you know, new technologies in terms of biotech. I mean, it, it has a story that it can very easily com- convince its population, um, especially given there's so many people out of work that they don't need to, to um, you know, focus on a more global agenda. Um, my, the last speaker is absolutely right that there are risks. I mean, we see it at the southern border right now, but I think We know it. I think it's a very hard sell um, to people now that governments should should you know sort of pursue a global agenda again. It's not what I wish, but I, I you know as I advise um, the boards I serve on, I very much take the view. Listen, we are in a siloed world. I think it will continue to be like that with Brexit. Um, and I'm sure um, uh, Lord Bomaria can talk about. Uh, uh, about exactly this, uh, you know, with with how the UK is readapting, refocusing its its uh, uh, its vision, uh, given uh, what's happened with Brexit. So, you know, what what do I know to be true um, in the next several decades? I know China is going to be important. I know technology is going to be important. That's how I'm thinking about portfolios. I wish globalization would come back in full swing. I'm not sure it will in the in the sort of in the, in the interim. Michael, uh, Dambisa talked there uh, about a, a one period in American history, the guild, so-called Gilded Age. Let me put to you another g- period of American history that's being talked about quite a lot, which is and that is the Roaring Twenties, right? People, uh, that was the last great uh, global pandemic that certainly had the kind of, you know, much worse, obviously, uh, thank God, we weren't quite as anywhere near as bad this time in terms of global death toll, but but the, the, the great influenza of 19, 1919, um, you know, was devastating. And then the world bounced back, particularly the United States, and it indeed led to this phenomenon of the roaring 20s. And there are some people who maybe see some parallels here that actually, you know, once, uh, once all these restrictions are lifted with all of this pent up demand, all of these savings, this great sense of relief that there will be and release, that we're going to kind of go crazy here in the U.S. and maybe elsewhere too. What's your view about that? You've lost you. I think you're either muted or we've lost you. We've lost your sound. We've lost your sound. Sorry. Yeah, I, was okay. muted. I was muted. Didn't want to interrupt with the background. Um, so I'm, I'm very much in agreement with that. Uh, um, with that. With that statement, I do think that we're going to see. Um, 
you know, it, it, a strong, uh, a strong comeback of the market, you know, the real estate market. Definitely, we're seeing that in specific markets. I'll address that. We need to start looking at at probably the most basic fact, which is the personal saving rate in the United States, right? So, if you look at numbers if from you know 2015 and on, saving uh, the personal saving rate in the, in the U.S. was in the sevens, somewhere between seven to eight um, percent. I believe it was April this year. It peaked at 33 percent. Then the last number that I've seen, Q1 of 2021, personal saving is almost 14 percent in the U.S. The, that is double the average that we've seen over the past decade. People want to spend money. It's the same. You know, you were asking earlier what what we've learned from um, what we've learned from 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 COVID. We've learned that two things. One, we love our home, and how important is our homes are and, and people spend all this money right now, you know, renovating their home and buying new homes. And we've seen a lot of activity on the private home side, but we also, uh, um, we've also realized how important it is to be out of the house and to be, as I said, with people and people want to spend money. We're seeing, we're seeing that. And if, if you look at, at, at the U S you look at, at in, in markets like New York, I'm talking about the prime markets, New York, San Francisco, LA, Miami, um, there is a tremendous uh, uh, want and need um, of, of consumers to go out and spending, to get service, to be treated, to go to restaurant. We're going to see, in my opinion, the maybe it's going to be the roaring 2021s or 2022s, but we're going to see uh, um, a huge uptick uh, in demand for every for everything from from you know consumer goods to real estate to service to travel. I'm sure you've seen the recent studies uh, um, that that. Um, people have said there's a, 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 tra- a travel survey that, that came recently that, that 75% of, of, of the people who surveyed say they've never wanted to travel more than in the past, in the past year. Cruise lines right now are booked. Um, hotel ADRs in, in Miami, Florida are at an all-time high. These are things that, that you're seeing really what – this is the, the, the tip of the iceberg of what's to come because the world is really closed. Um, you know, from the real estate size, we're seeing this in specific markets, right? The Florida market has been on fire. Prices of, of private homes, the prime private homes have doubled in the last year. Um, we're seeing now an uptick in New York real estate, which New York took a huge hit because of COVID. We were the large, probably the worst hit in COVID uh, um, as far as infection and, and the closure um, from, the, from the state. But all of a sudden, there's some feeling of life coming to the streets and there's a rush to buy real estate. I believe we're going to see that at every aspect. I can't talk about the rest of the world, um, but but from from the U.S. consumer's perspective, um, once as, as you said, you know, President Biden said that anybody can get vaccinated. It seems like we're going to cross the 100 million mark sooner than we expected. All these are great uh, milestones that are going to get us faster to recovery, faster to spending money, and faster to being together. Thank you. Um- uh, Karen Billamore, if I may ask you, you, you mentioned in your remarks about the importance of cooperation between government and private sector and academia. Actually, we saw, for example, with the development of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, we had the same in the United States here with the Operation Warp Speed on the first time of President Trump and the, um, you know, the, the great success, the extraordinary success we've had with the, with the vaccine, vaccine development and rollout. Um, I'm wondering, there is... These crises like these, great wars, pandemics, huge disruptions like these, do tend to lead to a pretty fundamental change in the way in which, in the role of governments in societies, and the way in which people um, relate to their government, and the role that they expect government to play. Um, it's pretty really obvious here in the U.S. that President Biden, you know, his, his administration and a Democratic-controlled con- Congress are intent on you know, really, as President Biden himself put it last week, shifting the paradigm. They really want to shift the paradigm. I'm wondering, do you think that this COVID crisis will result, will be seen by historians as kind of like the end of the of that era of kind of sort of neoliberal economics and free market sort of that began with the kind of Reagan future, Milton Friedman in the 1970s and 1980s. Is this like the end of that long period of, um, you know, pro-market, um, pro-globalization, pro-move, uh, you know, free movement, uh, the primacy of the market, and a move back perhaps uh, towards the kind of greater role for, for, for the for government in the economy that we've, that we saw perhaps in the, in the, in the previous, in the, in the post-World War II period? There's no question about it that you have had a situation in the UK, for example, 
in the last year, we're coming up to the anniversary of our first lockdown, which was the 23rd of March. And during this last year, the government in the UK has provided a huge amount of support to businesses and the economy. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's 400 billion pounds. Now, in absolute terms or per capita terms, that's one of the highest in the world. That includes a furlough scheme that has saved tens of millions of jobs. why unemployment is not at that level now is because of all the government measures, including rates, uh, holidays, including VAT being reduced from 20% to 5%. All these measures have helped businesses survive and helped to save the jobs. Now the key is going to be, is, and you've got a conservative government. A conservative government in the UK is pro-business, pro-entrepreneurship, pro-low taxes. And They've got public spending now at such a high level. We've got debt to GDP at 100 percent. The last time debt to GDP was 100 percent in the UK goes back to 1963. OK, at the end of the Second World War, it was 250 percent. But on the whole, we don't have high debt to GDP. So what we've got now is because of this government help and we've now managed the chances to listen to us, to the CBI, for example, to extend the support as the economy starts to open up. We're ahead of the world compared with most countries in vaccinating our population. We've now got up to over 25 million people vaccinated. We will be opening up our economy in a roadmap by the 21st of June is when we're predicting the economy will almost fully open up. The chief economist of the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, has referred to our economy like a coiled spring. And we've got, as, as, as we've heard uh, from Michael, we've got money that's been saved up, over 250 billion pounds. We've got people waiting to go out, waiting to meet people, waiting to go to pubs and restaurants and spend that money. And there could very well be a bounce back and a V-shaped recovery going ahead. Now, just to build on a couple of points you mentioned earlier about Brexit, and, and Amisa mentioned Brexit. Brexit, we are now post-Brexit, post-pandemic. And what have we got here? Britain is trying to be global, outward looking and open when people are saying, oh, well, with Brexit, you, you're going to be going inward looking and we're going out of our way to go outward looking with this global Britain. We had 60 trade deals that we rolled over, bilateral trade deals that the EU had with countries like Japan and Canada. People said you'll never be able to do it. A small country of 66 million people, a 500 million trading bloc, you'll never get the same terms. You'll never be able to do it. We rolled them over. And we've now just produced this week our integrated review, which is our defense and our foreign policy and our security review. And it's a tilt towards the Indo-Pacific. Note, I didn't say Asia-Pacific. I said Indo-Pacific because India is a big part of that. We've also just applied to join the CTPPP. That's 11 countries. So we're now looking broader. America is our biggest single trading partner, 15% of our trade. We could increase that hugely. The European Union, on the other hand, is still 45% of our trade at our doorstep. The whole of the Commonwealth, 54 countries, including India, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, makes up less than 10% of our trade. So we've got enormous potential to increase our trade globally, and that's what we're working on. And the point I also want to make is hard power and soft power. This is the time when a country's combination of hard power and soft power comes to the fore. And a small country like Britain, only 1% of the world's population, has a phenomenal combination of hard power and soft power. We've got our nuclear deterrent. We've just increased our defense spending. We've got the best universities in the world, along with the United States of America. So we've got phenomenal hard and soft power. And finally, when it comes to global leadership, here's a time when you can show global leadership. We're hosting G7 this year. We've got Australia, India and South Korea joining G7. And we've got COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference. And China has agreed to net zero by 2060. That's a huge move. We've got 2050 as our target. So we've got common ground here. And I think we've got to be optimistic about trying to be integrated in the way that we have been. And globalization, I'm all for it and we need to promote it. We've just got a few minutes left, so let me just give you all just a, a minute or so each to just to answer this this question. As we emerge from this crisis at, at different paces and in different ways, uh, what's the what 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 is the primary challenge? Uh, Lord Bellamore there just mentioned climate change, which we hadn't talked about previously. We've all talked about globalization and deglobalization. Um, we've talked about adjusting to you know the the the, the kind of the, the constraints of the pandemic. If, if we can, if I could start with you, just again, just very briefly, just in, in about a minute, 
as you look as you look out from here now, um, and again with the economy recovering, what 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 is the what's the what's the biggest challenge from your perspective that needs to be addressed, whether by businesses or by government? What 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 would you want? What do you want to leave people with in terms of what you what 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 they should be really focused on now uh, in the post COVID environment? Well, for me, I think first we have to think of our people. And uh, what those things that will um, make sure that we have uh, everybody in a, a good state of mind and uh, health that they're able to get back to work. Two, it's as much as countries will be highly tempted to go back to their tent, each one, it would be clear that there are too many countries, as, as you heard my colleague talk about uh, the UK and all its plan for uh, post-Brexit, it's dependent on our interactions and economic activities with multiple countries, including the Commonwealth, which my country is, is one of them. And if you look at the African region, the African free trade is just taking off in the middle of all of this because we're trying to trade with one another a lot more. So the temptation will be there for all of us to pull back into our individual tents. Maybe, you know, like my colleague said, America might you know, um, have the possibility to survive that. But even then, it's fed largely by talents and uh, interaction with the rest of the world in, in, in multiple ways and all of that. So we need to, at the end of the day, remember that we still need one another and we do need to work together in order to achieve the goals of the world. Thank you. Dembisa, if you would briefly, just what, what do you see as the principal challenge or challenges? One word, growth economic growth. Um, there's no way we can solve climate change, income inequality, education, healthcare, any of the seemingly intractable challenges. I'm even going to go out on a limb and say we cannot solve issues of cultural clashes and religious uh, fervor without economic growth. If the pie is not expanding, forget it. And that means governments need to be much more data driven, much more leaning forward, much more um, measured outcomes, not corrupt. Um, but corporations need to do the same. Um, we need to lock arms and to start thinking about how are we going to, dri to drive a process of expanding that pie so that we can bring human um, success and living standard improvements over time. Without it, we're going to retreat. Um, we're going to have clashes. We're going to have the sort of narrow thinking of deglobalization. That's it. And Lisa, thank you. That was excellent and, and uh, concise. Michael, um, you, you're very optimistic uh, about things. Well, if there's something that's keeps you awake at night about this, um, you know, as we enter this post-COVID world, what would it be? Yeah, I think the, there's a, uh, um, we're seeing something very interesting in the U.S. right now, which is these, you know, states fighting over people. Um, we're noticing, if you look at, and I'm, I'm talking a little bit about, you know, again, from a real estate perspective, Florida, New York, and California, which you're seeing that, that, that there's a huge shift right now in, in how government is, um, is trying to attract people to, in essence, taking them from one state, importing them into their state, one state to the other. Florida has been done everything, have, have been doing everything possible to bring people down uh, uh, to Florida. Great economic benefits, open to people, open to business. While I see other states, if it's New York or California, that have not been as friendly. Um, we're really feeling it he very hard in the United States, and we're feeling really if almost that kind of this 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 clash between between the different states, which I think is as a long term, it's not a good thing here in the U.S. I hope that you know when COVID subsides, people get back a little bit to normal um, and not see the the the, the COVID the COVID uh, period as an opportunity to 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 have some kind of big. Uh, economic shifts between the different states and, and, and big uh, uh, population shifts. Thanks, Michael. And uh, Karen Bilimora, um I'll give you the last word on this. What's your um, what's the Thank primary thing you think we should be focused on? Thank you very much. I think it's got to be growth, but growing together. It's putting people first. It's education. It's lifelong learning. People having to reskill, constantly adapt. Technology, ed tech, fintech, we've just had some great reviews here. The vaccines, look at the vaccine diplomacy that India, giving it to UN peacekeepers. We in Britain have said that once we have our surplus, we will share that with the world. It's that sharing and working together, being outward looking, collaborating, and diversity and inclusion is going to be more and more important. Companies that embrace it are more profitable and more innovative. And I think there's going to be huge growth in, in Africa, huge growth in the Indo-Pacific region, and I'm very optimistic about the future. 
that is a very good note on which to end, a good optimistic note. Um, we've, uh, we've all acknowledged that the world has changed, but not ended. And there's a fair amount of optimism there about the immediate and the longer term outlook, but with a dose of realism and concern about some of the challenges that we face too. So um, a generally positive picture from this panel. Thank you very much indeed, uh, all four of you. That was a really good um, and I think really comprehensive and very geographically uh, diverse um, uh, assessment of the global economic prospects. So thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you all of you for listening. Thanks to uh, Horasis uh, for hosting this uh, fascinating discussion. And I look forward to talking to you all again. And in the meantime, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you very much. Nice. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, well. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Okay, I think we, I think we're done. I think we're done. You're all released. Thank you very much. That was terrific. I appreciate it.